I'm Katherine Patterson Krikorian, better known as Pat locally. I came, I was born in Oxford, Mississippi in October 1921. And I joined the military primarily because we are a very patriotic family. And uh, I had three brothers and one sister who were involved at that time. Later on, my mother thought she was losing out on things, so she went to work in an ammunition factory. <laughs> we laugh about that. Uh, I came to Los Alamos in late August of 1943, and my first impression was it was a totally different world from what I had grown up in as far as flora and fauna were concerned. However, I adjusted very well, but I did have high altitude sickness because I came from Florida. So for about two weeks, I was so sick with headaches and nausea and everything else. But uh, things settled down and I took my assignment, which was with the fiscal section. In the fiscal section, we were putting together the original purchase orders, the delivery reports, because we had a railhead in Santa Fe where things were delivered to Bronze Hospital, to their warehouse first. And then we got an invoice from our, uh, the person we purchased, our company we purchased it from. And we had to make everything agree which really was a little difficult because <laughs> the delivery was not always what the purchase order said, nor was it like the invoice said. And uh, then we put a voucher on it, a government voucher, which is a 1030, standard form 1034, and sent it to Oak Ridge for payment. We also handled the travel. Hold on just a second. We'll just wait till the museum announcements has these time. announcements every half an hour. They come about every half an hour. So we have to pause. Everybody has to get stopped in their tracks. <laughs> <laughs> they don't want that in the background. It's all right. Yeah. It just takes a second. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. Ask. Along about uh, January of 44, we got a lot, our first group really, of the SEDs who came in. And among that group, was a bunch of finance people, accountants, and what have you. So there was a big shortage for stenographers, and I was sent over to be secretary for the contracting officer over at the lab, which was Colonel Stanley Stewart. And uh, we set up a, a little satellite office consider, uh, consisting of uh, procurement section, a young man who was a soldier who also ran the personnel aspects, uh, and they handled, he handled all of the raises and personnel actions of the University of California that came through. And then we had a file clerk and we had me. Uh, we were sort of a busy office and Colonel Stewart came out of the Cal University of California's office which was the primary office for the contracting officer at that stage. And we um, really did a little bit of everything. And I worked there until I was really discharged in December, and well, really in January of 1946. I really don't know how much more you want me to give you. Oh, you want to hear about my security problems. I had a, uh, well, first, let me take you back to my original basic training in Florida. I had been a instructor in the Army Specialized Training School. And when this finished, they brought me in and asked me about going to OCS. And I said, I really don't want to go to OCS. Well, this, this struck them as being very odd that I didn't want to go. They said, well, what do you want to do? And I said, well, 
I really would like to go overseas. So they said, fine. Uh, why do you want to go overseas? In which direction? So I said, well, it doesn't matter. I have a brother in the European theater and one in the South Pacific. So I'd like to go either way. Well, we went through the basic overseas training, along with military personnel teaching us jujitsu, all sorts of things. Anyhow, I ended up living in a tent, and there were 10 of us, and then one night, very early, uh, 2 a.m. in the morning, they came in and said, Patterson, get your things together. Uh, you're leaving. I said, how about everyone else? So I ended up going to the railroad station at 2 in the morning. We had, uh, I got down there, and there were seven others I had never seen before, did not know. But it was a real congenial group, and I said, where are we going? Well, we had a master sergeant with us, this girl, and she said, well, we won't know until we get on the train and get our, we were, had our top secret orders. We were not to open them until we got on the train. So we had to go through all of these service commands at that time, and there was one in Atlanta, and then there was one in Fort Sill. So when we got to Atlanta, we got two more MPs that escorted us across. But we had to stop in Memphis. So real quick, like, I went to the ladies' room, and I called my mother, who was living in Memphis at that time. And I said, hey, I'm going overseas. And she said, oh, which way are you going? I said, I don't know where I'm going <laughs> at this stage. Well, a day or so later, we went on to Fort Sill, Oklahoma. And we stayed in Fort Sill about two or three weeks. And it was really odd. We were just sitting there doing nothing but playing. We climbed Gunner's Hill. We went to the movies. We went swimming. We did it all. And uh, finally, they ended up putting us on a train, a troop train. And we came across Oklahoma and ended up in Berlin. Well, on, en route, we had stopped at Clovis, New Mexico. The train did not have a diner on it, so we got off and ate in a gymnasium down there. So we got back on the train, and they took us off in Berlin. And we were met by two MPs. Well, it took a little while. We were sitting around. I had never been west. I had no idea, but it was the most gorgeous sunset. And uh, leaning against the walls was these funny-looking people. To me, they were. Uh, it was either Indians or some of the native, local natives. And they had these big hats on. With, we don't see it now, but we did at that time. A lot, it was a lot of souvenir type of things, They're like bookends and things like that, that showed these Spanish people or Indians with these big hats and their heads all tilted over. Well, finally, the, the train came for us, and these two MPs got off, and the train had one little car. It was a little, it, the engine was an old-fashioned cattle catcher car uh, engine. So there was an old Indian there who had long pigtails hanging down his back and was gray-haired, and he asked if he could ride the train. Well, this was quite a, a discussion. So finally, the MPs and the engineer decided that we could, that he could, he wanted to go to Isleta, which was between Berlin and Albuquerque. So we got into, he, he got on the train with us, and the train did not stop for him. They told him they would not stop, they would just slow down. So I kept wondering, how is this old man going to just jump off this train? He'll get killed. But he did, and I mean, he apparently was quite used to 
catching the train in between uh, Berlin and Isleta. We got into Albuquerque and we were marched off to this hotel to spend the night. By this time, it's really very late. And we were in two rooms and we looked at it and there was a, a restaurant down there. And since we hadn't had anything to eat since lunchtime and it was eight, nine maybe in the evening, we decided we'd go get some hamburgers and something to drink. So I, being one of the younger ones, was nominated <laughs> to go get all this along with somebody else. And so we went down to do this. And as we opened the door, the MPs said, well, they were guarding us. And they said, where do you think you're going? And we said, well, we really hadn't had anything to eat, and we were all so hungry. And he said, well, they had a little conference, and he said, well, you may go, but we'll ha one of us will have to go with you. And the other one was going to stand guard over the rest of the crowd. So we went down and got the hamburgers and the drinks and came back. So they told us that we had to get up the next morning at 6 o'clock. There was a call for us and that we would be given breakfast. And then we were to go somewhere else. Well, we wondered all night where we were going. But we got up the next morning, had breakfast, had two more new MPs. And we were marched down to the bus station. And we got on this bus, just the wax, and two MPs. And when we left Albuquerque, I thought, oh, we're leaving civilization for sure. When we got on out, this was back in the days when you went through Bernalillo, and it was a sort of a two-lane road through there. But when we came over those hills and those funny-looking little scrubby cedars, which I had never seen. They looked like dots on the mountainsides. I thought the Lord sent us to, away for 40 days and or more, maybe 40 years for all I knew. But we got into Santa Fe and it was very hot. But we were met by uh, the captain and two cars. Well, I was assigned to come up in the old 1936 station wagon that the school had had. And with us was an, uh, uh, Sarah Hearn, who was an engineer. Sarah was a red-headed gal who stood about six feet tall, an engineer from way back, but scared of heights. She was just scared to death coming up the hill. And she and I were on the back seat. And she kept throwing her hands over her head every time she looked over the canyon. Oh, Lord, she'd say. And she would be over on my side. Then we'd go somewhere else, and she'd look around another curve. Oh, Lord, she'd say. And she'd jump back in my lap every time it was on her side. Well, we got to Los Alamos, and we were met by the security crowd, uh, an officer, and we were booked into what is now the Ogun House, is that what, not, not the Baker House, the other house. There used to be the Leonsdahl House. The people who owned the uh, downstairs. And we were there for about a week, but that's where I was so sick, well, two weeks, with uh, altitude sickness. and. We stayed in that until the dormitory was built, which was down what is now uh, Trinity Drive. We ate our meals at the Fuller Lodge. And then, of course, we had gotten our assignments. My assignment was with the fiscal section at that time. And we just maneuvered around doing our thing, and uh, when we finally got into the barracks, though, we still had to come to the hill to eat because we didn't have a mess hall. 
Finally, when we did get the SEDs in in January, they built a mess hall for us. But we used to come up and down the hill from about where the dental office is now, McClendon's dental office. We used to do that about six times every day. We'd come up in the morning to eat, back down to do our uh, duty, uh, scrub the latrines or whatever we were supposed to be doing, and then back to work, back down after lunch, you see. I mean, it was just a, a constant run up and down the hill. But there was a big shortage for people to do work in the PXs, the movie and everything. So we went to, a lot of us went to work in the movies. There were about six or eight of us that went to work in the movies. I mean, we were ushering and doing tickets and this, that, and the other at the movie. And then, of course, we went back down the hill at night. The thing that always fascinated me was how much colder it was then. And, of course, I had never seen snow being from Mississippi. So the first big snowstorm we had was long in September after I came. I mean, it was a big snow snowstorm. But... One night we were walking across the pond after we got through working in the movie. And the ice was so thick we could just walk across it, of course. But here the old ducks had frozen in the ice. So we went back to the firehouse, which was where the little uh, community building is now. And we got some of the guys to go with us, and we took an axe and chopped these old ducks out and took them back and put them in this, uh, under these pot bellied stoves until they thawed out, which I thought was really a fascinating thing because I just had never seen so much snow or all this cold. But I was discharged in, in January of 1946. And as a final fling, there were a group of us that decided we'd go to California to the Rose Bowl game. Well, at least to the parade. Well, that's a little story within itself. We um, ended up going up a, a, a street, and it turned out to be one of the vice presidents of the University of California. And he invited us to come and sit in his box for the football game, but we did not do this. Uh, we were really on a sort of a short schedule, so after the parade, we we left California and went on down to Fort Sam Houston, where we were all being discharged. But about the security, I had a brother who was in the counterintelligence corps, and Jack was... Uh, his partner was a, a young boy who apparently had grown up in Los Alamos, but I did not know this at that time. And he wrote this letter and he said that he knew exactly where I was. And you come out to Camel Rock and that's where the pavement ends and the gravel road begins. And you come up to Pulwaki, and you turn left, and you go through the village of some little village. He gave it a name. I think it's lost now what the name of it was. It might have been Yacona or something like that. Anyhow, through the San Ildefonso Pueblo and up Ottawa Canyon and blah, blah, blah into Los Alamos. Well, I'm reading this letter, and I get this call from Major De Silva. And he said, Sergeant, I wonder if you'd come to my office right now. Well, I thought, oh, what did I do? So I go in, and he said, Sergeant, who is this Lieutenant J.W. Patterson that you got a letter from today? And I said, oh, that's my brother. And he said, what does he do? I said, I don't know what he does. I just know he's on Eisenhower's staff. He's in Europe but that's all I know. Well, he said, you write your brother and ask him where he got all this information. 
since you said you did not mail anything off the hill and didn't have anybody mail anything off. So I sat down and wrote Jack and said, hey, where do you get all of this information? Well, the next letter I get said, all these things I gather by gazing into my crystal ball. He said, go by the PX and see if Benza Gonzalez has shot his hand. You do it yet. Be careful and don't ride that black stallion named Chile from the corral under the hill. And all these little things. Well, I'm sitting here reading this letter, and lo and behold, Major De Silva calls again. So I didn't know whether to start packing my things and clearing out my desk then and getting ready to go to the South Pacific or whether to go to the brig. Anyhow, I go down, and Major De Silva reads me the right act once more. And he said, Sergeant, you will not hear from this brother for the duration of the war. And you may not write him because he will not get it. So I thought, whoops, I'm in trouble. But they didn't ship me out anywhere, although I did have a few scary moments about it. I thought I might end up having to go. But years later, after we all got back home safely, Jack said to me, I have something for you. He said, I started to mail it, but I decided not to. And here was a hand-drawn map of the Los Alamos Boys Ranch School. So I said, Jack, where did you get this? And he said, my partner, all during the war, was a young man named Herman Russo, who was the son of the treasurer of the Los Alamos Boys School Foundation. And he had grown up in Los Alamos. Well, there's a little bit more to this story. Because when I went back south, after I was discharged and went to work on my old job, I got a call one day, and it was from Hazel Greenbacher, who said, would you like to come back to Los Alamos? She was pregnant and going to have twins. So I said, well, let me think about it a couple of weeks. So I did, but in the meantime, when I came in, it was Labor Day weekend, and Mr. Aker, who was at the managing the lodge, said to me, hey, Pat, he said, I've put you in with a school teacher. I said, okay, that's all right. He said, you can't get housing until Monday. And this was Saturday. So I'm unpacking a few things, and this young girl comes in. And I said, oh, hi, I'm Pat Patterson. And she said, I'm Joan Russo. And I said, do you have a brother named Herman? And she said, yes, I do. Do you have a brother named Jack? <laughs> and I said, yes, I do. But that's pretty much the end of my security story. <laughs> Um, uh, let's see, you talked um, in your group of, of the, in the Women's Army Corps, did most of the uh, uh, people who entered with you that day and in 43 stay till 46? Yes, all of them did. All of that group stayed. The group that I came in with all stayed in Los Alamos and until 46. No one stayed after 46, though. I mean, we were all discharged and everybody went home. And some did come back after that, but none out of my group. And is this a reflection that, that people enjoyed their time at Los Alamos? Oh, I think everybody enjoyed their time. We were just sort of uh, worked into the melting pot, so to speak, of people. I mean, there was no real distinction between any scientists and 
his secretary or anybody else that, of the janitor even, see. Uh, it was a fascinating uh, assignment. I don't think, under the circumstances, I could have had a better assignment than I had. We used to ride horseback and we ice skated and we could check out a car and go over the hill to Bandelier area if we wanted to. Uh, we could picnic, we could go by and pick up whatever we wanted to eat at, at the mess halls. And we had a lot of dances. Uh, of course, down in the MP area where they had a recreation area, uh, recreation big room is where we had a lot of the dances. Uh, and then we had some at Fuller Lodge along with the civilians. Do you have any um, sort of recollections or about Robert Oppenheimer? Or the only time I ever really had any connections with him was on Easter of 1944. Did you say connections with Robert Oppenheimer? Because we're going to cut the questions out. He, uh, we were working up in Oppenheimer's office, and we were getting, uh, filling out papers for draft deferment for all the scientists. And he came in that evening to sort of greet us, I guess. There was a whole bunch of us. There were about 10 of us working on this. What about General Groves? Did you ever see him? In yeah, we ran into General Groves quite frequently. I mean, and that was pretty common. And what was he like? How did he come across? Well, I can't really say. You know, everybody thought he was so gruff and this, that, and the other. But I don't think he was ever gruff with us. Uh, and on VE Day, uh, when we had a lot of people in here, it was really quite a, a celebration for everybody in front of Fuller Lodge. We did not have a lot of uh, things like you had on a regular base. All we had was the movie and our dances and our basketball and softball and things like that. We didn't have what everybody else had. I mean, on big bases. We just had each other. <laughs> One big family. That's great. Um, let's see. You know, I got a quick one. Okay. Um, how much knowledge, you were a secretary in a, in a non-com, how much knowledge did you have of what was going on? Well, our, our office was through, we had to walk through the shops, the V shop, and it was up above that. And I remember that we were standing there one day and we looked out the window and they were making this, I suppose it was something to carry a gadget in. And I said, what, what they're doing out there, you know, but as far as actually knowing what really took, was going on, we did not. However, we had a lot of friends that went to Trinity site, and we knew that something was going on there, and there was a bunch of us that they let go out. I think we were on Dome Hill or Road or something. I don't, I didn't, at that time, I did not know what some of these hills were called. <laughs> But a uh, bunch of us did go out that night. And you saw that? And they let us out in the flash. Mm -hmm. And that was it. And so you just went outside at the door and just... No, out. no. We went, we went up the, in the Hamas. But I don't really know where we went is the thing. I've had several people call and say, were we on the ski run? Were we... You know, the old ski run, where we, where were we? But I think we were out on the Dome Road somewhere there. Did you know what was going on? Did you know what the flash was? No, we really didn't uh, know exactly what was going on. 
Afterwards, did anybody talk about it? Oh, yeah. Okay. Well, afterwards, we had quite a little celebration. Uh, you mean at the end of the war or after Trinity? Well, after Trinity, okay. Trinity they had a little celebration. And then after the war, uh, this was really something. I mean, we went uptown. We came uptown from down in the barracks. And we went over to the old big theater. And here were people in their pajamas and their nightgowns and their hair curlers, and everybody was just whooping it up 90 to nothing. Uh, <clears throat> I guess it was the first bomb that a bunch came down what we call Trinity. And they had garbage can lids banging them together, you know, and all this, that, and the other. This was quite a, quite a thing. The first shot and the second one, of course, brought on the end of the war. And it was the end of the war that was the real celebration, so to speak. And how did um, you react when you learned how powerful the weapon was? And I don't really know. I don't recall how I felt. I mean, I, I just sort of thought, this thing is over and we're all going to get to go home. But however, we had to hang in, you know, for another six months or so after the after the end of the war, really. And I was probably around the first group that went out because we'd been here longer than anybody else. But I guess they were waiting on some replacements. I never really knew. <laughs>